All right, here we go. Welcome to the Facebook Live edition of the Joe Sikora Show. So nice to have you along. I want you to give yourself, I want you to think about presents, right? We're coming in to, well, we're in the Christmas season. Christmas is right around the corner. And maybe you're spending time in the malls. Ugh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I hate shopping. Maybe you're spending time in the malls or browsing the internet trying to figure out what to give someone, that person that you love. Well, I've got a better idea. What if you actually spent some time giving yourself a present? Oh, does that sound selfish? No, when you give yourself this present, you will actually become a blessing to others. What am I talking about? I mean, giving yourself the present of letting go. Why am I so animated? <laughs> hey, Teresa, how are you? You missed my opening. It was really great. <laughs> I want you to give yourself a present this Christmas of letting go of those things that are causing you to be bitter. Are you bitter? Are you struggling? Do you not know that you are living in misery? I thought of this as a metaphor today. <laughs> it's not a great one. <laughs> it just popped in me. I thought, oh, I'm going to use this. I, it's pretty good. Maybe it's not. But I thought about this. Have you ever gotten into the bath and said, oh, this is too cold? Probably not. Why? Because you ran that bath water or gotten into the shower and said, oh, this is too hot. Probably not. Because you changed the temperature and you said, you know what? Here we go. It feels good. Now, I want you to consider that your life is actually the same way. If you're feeling like, oh, it's too cold or it's too hot, guess what? You can do something about it. You can change what you feel. You can change what you experience. You can turn up the heat or turn it down, whatever it is that you need in your life. You don't have to actually experience the bitterness, the anger, the resentment that you're experiencing right now. So if you want to give yourself a great gift, again, which will also be a blessing to others, let go of the bitterness. I want to talk about some of the habits that can make you feel bitter. What's interesting is sometimes you might think, well, this is just who I am. It's like my grumpy neighbor across the street. Oh, nope. <laughs> I'm going to use that as an example because I just put myself in hot water. When I first moved in to this lovely neighborhood, and I love my neighborhood. Uh, hey, NorCal, how are you? Uh, when I first moved into this neighborhood, my kids were out playing out front, and they hit a little tennis ball, and it ran into the neighbor's garage door. No big deal. It's a tennis ball, right? Didn't go through there, anybody's window. My neighbor came back and said, oh, I'm going to hold on to this tennis ball, right? And my wife, being Mama Bear, went over there, give me that tennis ball back. And so I thought, you know what? I've got a choice. I could actually view this man as being bitter and avoid him like the plague. But then I thought that's not going to create a very nice existence for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years that I live in here, God willing, in this neighborhood. So I, I thought rather than seeing him as a bitter old man, I thought I'm going to see what is good in him. And I, choose, I chose to go over and have a pleasant conversation. I chose to see what was good. And sometimes, here's the point, he actually became a great neighbor. He's a wonderful, wonderful man, a wonderful person, I think, misunderstood. But the point that I want to make in this is sometimes we become bitter because we look at other people and we say, he's just a bitter old man, or she is bitter, or this is just how I am. I'm bitter, I'm angry, I'm resentful. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. <laughs> Why did I say that? It is a lie because the reality is we give ourselves all sorts of explanations for why people are this or that. And we forget that we're wonderfully made. We're magnificent creations and God has called us to a changed life. And if you feel bitter because of anything that has happened to you in your past, you can change. You can let that go. You can give yourself the gift of letting go of the bitterness. You know, Sometimes, the story in Job, it comes to mind, right? Remember the story of Job? Job, chapter one, page one, right? Job had this magnificent blessed life. I mean, he was loved by his wife. He had many children. He had thousands of sheep, which I guess in that day was a great thing to have, right? These days, I wouldn't count that as a big blessing, but if you're a farmer, I guess it was wonderful. Anyway, Job, Job was rich beyond everything, and he was happy. 
Now, here's the interesting story. I'm not going to go into the whole theological thing, but God was having a conversation with the devil. And the devil said, oh, yeah, Job is happy, right? Because he's been blessed with everything. Okay, dealt, you know, God says, take those things away from him. So Job loses everything. He loses his family. He loses his wife. He loses his sheep. He, <laughs> right, all these things. And Job became bitter. He, he literally said, obliterate the day I was born. <laughs> he, he's like, blank out the night I was conceived. Let it be a black hole in space. May the God above forget that it ever happened. May I be erased. Job became embittered. Now, here's what I want you to remember. Job was looking at his circumstances. When he had everything, he was very happy. When he lost everything, he was very happy. But God said, Job, you're not getting this, right? You're not really understanding. You don't have to be bitter. Now, in the end, again, Job actually experienced great, great blessings. But, and life turned out, life changed. And the question is this, would Job have actually learned to let go of his bitterness had his life not changed? I actually think yes. And I think that if you're experiencing bitterness or anger or resentment, your life can change. It's actually a myth. It's a fallacy to believe that everybody else has to get in line with your image or your belief of how life has to shape up so that you can be happy. That's the myth of arrival, as some people call it, right? It's just not true. But the truth is, what is keeping you from experiencing joy in your life is things like forgiveness. Now, you might think that forgiveness is something that we just speak about as Catholics or Christians. Not true. Forgiveness is one of these psychological principles that is actually really well studied and researched. And forgiveness or withholding forgiveness is something that can actually contribute more to your bitterness more than anything else. But the reason why you might be holding on to the bitterness, the reason why you might be withholding forgiveness is because you don't understand what forgiveness is. God says, you must forgive. So what does that mean? Does that mean that you have to reconcile? Does that mean that you have to forget what somebody did to you? No, absolutely not. Does that mean that that person has to come back and say, oh, I'm sorry, okay, I forgive you? That's not what forgiveness is at all. Withholding forgiveness is going to keep you bitter. And again, I want you to give yourself the best Christmas present of all, and you'll be a blessing to others when you forgive. Because when you withhold forgiveness, you are the one who suffers. You are the one that holds on to the resentment. Forgiveness isn't saying it's okay what you did. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness means that you're allowing yourself to be free from the resentment of having been wrong, that you accept, in fact, that something bad happened to you, but you also accept that you can be free from the evil. You can be free from the hurt. You can be free from the wound. You can live a life independent. You don't have to perseverate any longer on revenge. Because as long as you do that, you remain a victim of that wound, of that person. So when you stop dwelling on how to make that person pay, then you can actually forgive when you let go of the resentment. So forgiveness or a lack of forgiveness corrodes your emotional well-being. It's true. And forgiveness has been found according to secular research. Again, we speak about this as Catholics and other Christians. Oh, I must forgive, right? <laughs> But the secular researchers also say, you must forgive. Why? Because they found that when you forgive, it reduces your state of depression. It reduces stress. It reduces hostility. It improves your self-esteem. It even improves your physical health. So if you're thinking right now, gosh, I want to get healthy January 1st, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, join the gym, start eating more vegetables. But speak about forgiveness. Uh, your comment, we have been in uh, a familiar darkness with adult kids who hate our Catholics. I'm trying to see more of what you wrote there. Um, well, look, I, I can't see the rest of your comment right now, but they are, you're, you're with family who hate your Catholic faith. They're the ones who are suffering. 
That's what I want to say first and foremost. So you can actually have pity on those who hate. You got to love them because they're the ones who are suffering. Anybody who hates, trust me, they are paying a price that their own soul is, is suffering. And so I would say for sure that anybody who finds they are hating you because of your faith, what do you do? You love them just as Christ did, right? He loved while he was on the cross. People literally hated what he did and their hate prevented them from celebrating actually the miracles. Remember the story, what was it? Who did Jesus heal? Oh, it was the man's hand, right? There was a cripple, he had a crippled hand. And it looked something like, I don't know what it looked like, but it, it didn't work, right? And Jesus turned to those who hated him. He hated what he represented. He hated love. He hated the idea of forgiveness. And he said, so what do you think? On this day, would it be good, right? It just happened to be a Sabbath. Is it a good thing to do good on the Sabbath or not? They're, oh, we just hate you. We don't care what you do. Jesus, undeterred by their hate, he said, I forgive you. I heal you. And the hand, right, became healed. And how did they respond? Did they say, wow, I guess this hate thing isn't any good? No, they actually went off and figured out how they could kill the one who actually healed this man's hand. So again, hate prevents you from seeing life. It helps you from seeing and experiencing the miraculous. So pity those who hate you. Love them back. So anyway, I hope, hey, hi from Milwaukee. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Um, so love those who hate you. Feel pity for those. Uh, but these things that are keeping you from experiencing real joy, right? And in this season of Advent, God wants you to experience joy. So what are some of these things that you might be doing that are preventing you from feeling joy? We talked about forgiving others. How about this? How about forgiving yourself? Yeah, what are you doing? What have you done in your life? And you just can't let it go. You're living with regret, embarrassment, shame, guilt because of a mistake. It might have been a big mistake. It might have been a small mistake. But somehow you came to the understanding or the belief that you don't deserve to feel good. So you say, oh, yes, I love others. Oh, sure, I love myself, but, you know, I can't forgive myself. Why? Why is it okay for you to not forgive yourself? It's not okay. Again, when you don't forgive yourself, I want to speak about it from just a secular standpoint right now because I think God wants you to forgive yourself. Why? Because God has forgiven you. God wants you to act as he acts. So God wants you to forgive you. What are you holding on to? What have you done that you say, no, I don't deserve this forgiveness? Remember what God said, there is nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. And that goes for yourself. It's true. It is a hard one, shoo shoo, to forgive yourself. But it's so important and it's so necessary because a lack of forgiveness for self actually leads to depression. It does. If you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with all of this, why are you withholding forgiveness from yourself? Look, Here's what I want you to do. If you're struggling to forgive yourself, just accept the fact that this is a struggle for you, right? Don't deny it. Just accept it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time forgiving myself. But remember what God says, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You must forgive others. God has forgiven you. You must forgive yourself. Again, it's one of these things that keeps you feeling bitter. You might say, oh, I forgive the world. <laughs> Do you forgive yourself? Give yourself the gift because you're not only blessing yourself when you forgive yourself, you will become a blessing to others because you will live a different life. Because when you treat yourself with compassion, you will become more compassionate with other people. So we're talking about the greatest gift that you can give to yourself this Christmas. I know it'd be nice to go out and buy that four-wheel drive pickup truck but I did that last year. <laughs> uh, sorry. No, I didn't. It's not four-wheel drive. But I did get the truck that I wanted after Christmas, after all the sales, with the blessing of my wife. But one of the other things that's probably keeping you feeling bitter is living in a world that is black and white. 
And what I mean is black and white thinking because this all or nothing thinking, it just underlies so many unhealthy psychological st states. Black or white thinking, I'm all good or I'm all bad. She's great or she's terrible. I love, I hate, there's nothing in between. Listen, life is messy. You're going to mess things up and you're going to be doing great things. Other people are going to do the same thing. But it's dysfunctional thinking when your life, when your outlook is so rigid that you love or you hate. When I hear people do that, you know, it's like, I hate that person. I hate all Republicans. I hate Democrats. I hate... Stop, right? We're all kind of a broken mess trying to be formed by God. And it's not an all or nothing way to move through life thinking it's one or the other. God loves you. God chose to love, chose to die for you when your life was pretty messed up. <laughs> so you've got to love other people as well when you, you know, rather than seeing them. I want to give you an example from scripture and all or nothing thinking, right? Paul in Galatians, he speaks about this, Galatians chapter one. And Paul said, you know, when he first, before he became a Christian, before he became a follower of Jesus, he said, in those days, I went all out persecuting those of the way, right? In other words, Paul was saying, I persecuted God's church. He said, I was systematically destroying it. He said, I was so enthusiastic about the traditions of my ancestors. Paul looked at life and he said, all good, you're all bad. And it literally led to murder, literally, because Paul thought he had it all together. Now, Paul literally got knocked off his donkey, was blinded, and God spoke to him, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Why do you think you've got all the answers? You don't have it at all. And Paul learned a sense of compassion and Paul recognized that, yes, he was called out of God's generosity, right? Paul says this, it's an amazing thought. It's like God calls you and God calls me out of a sense of generosity, not because you're all good or all bad, but by God's love. And when you live according to God's way, Paul speaks about this beautifully in Galatians chapter five. He said, when you when you live God's way, he brings gifts into your lives, like like fruit in an orchard, things like affection for others, you know, an exuberance about life and serenity, a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart. You find yourself involved in loyal commitments, not able, not needing to force your way in life. Again, the all or nothing thinking just leads you to think it's this way and that's it. And that's not God's way. God's way is a way of compassion and love. Now, one of the other things, time is going so fast. I've got about 35 pages of notes that I have for myself, and I'm on page two. Oh, well, that's all right. But one of the other things, a trait that might be keeping you feeling bitter, and I want you to experience the greatest gift of all this Christmas by letting go of the bitterness and finding yourself in a state of love and joy. One of the things that might be keeping yourself feeling bitter is holding other people up to a higher standard than yourself, right? You're constantly disappointed with other people. They're constantly annoying you. You never feel like you're being treated as you deserve. Look, maybe you do have people in your life who are not good fitting, but maybe you're actually looking and holding people to a higher standard than you actually should. Jesus spoke about this very principle. He talked about the hypocrites, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees of the time, trying to tell everybody what they should do, trying to tell everybody how wrong they were. And again, God said, you have no love in your life. That's not going to make you happy. God says, and this is a very sobering thought. I'm trying to think where this is written. Paul wrote it in Romans, and I'll think of the chapter in a second. I think it's chapter seven or eight, but I could be wrong. And, and Paul writes, one day, you are going to be kneeling down in front of the Lord. <laughs> and you are going to be faced with what you have done, right? Again, God isn't going to comment to you about what other people have done. God's going to hold you up and he's going to say, how did you love? How did you care? How did you forgive? 
So again, if you feel like other people are constantly disappointing you, right, or constantly letting you down or not living life as they should, I say hold up the mirror because the orientation really should be how am I doing? How am I loving? Uh, Stephen, your comment. Uh, Pope Francis said, the Lord never tires of forgiving. I agree. Uh, I wish I could see the rest of your comment, uh, Stephen, but I did. I, it's true. Uh, God never tires of forgiving. A greater challenge is God wants us to never tire of forgiving. Remember when Jesus, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times 70. Now, I'm not doing the math. I, I, I don't think it adds up to whatever that adds up to, right? Hundreds of times. No, it's infinity. So God wants you to never tire of forgiving. I think another trait or quality or belief you could say, I appreciate your questions. I'm sorry if I miss so many of them. I, sometimes I just get caught up and I'm, I, I forget to look at your questions. But if you have a question and you want to talk about what is plaguing you right now, particularly if you're feeling bitter about something, uh, please feel free to type it in and I'll do my best to address specifically what is causing you pain right now. Uh, just remember when you type it in, this is a public forum, so it's not like therapy. This isn't private or confidential, so everybody can see what you're writing. But I encourage you, if you're feeling bitter or struggling right now to forgive, to type it in and uh, I'll address it as best I can live. But maybe one of the things that is keeping you feeling bitter right now is a belief that things will never get better. Psychologists and researchers speak about this as learned helplessness. You get to a place and whether it's depression that you're struggling with or you don't have a job, or you're in a relationship that isn't going well, you think to yourself, and this is what actually just contributes to the depression, it's never going to change. Everything changes. Everything changes, right? Each day you wake up and you get younger, so you wish. <laughs> Each day you get a little bit older, your relationships change. This dark and difficult place that you might find yourself to be in right now, it too will change. It too will pass. So if you're struggling right now, if you're feeling bitter because you think it'll never change, let go of that idea. It's not true. By the very nature of creation, all things change and they can change for the better. So again, when you feel as though uh, it, things will never get, things will never improve or things will never change. It actually puts you at increased risk, risk for depression and even suicide. You know, if you're depressed, but you have the belief, yeah, I'm really struggling right now, but you know, someday it might get better. You're less likely to commit a violent action upon yourself and take your own life. But people who commit suicide, right? I, I know this is a dark topic and I'm not here to talk about suicide in particular tonight. But if you believe things will never get better, that's what leads you to that impulsive act, that desperate act to take your own life. But when you say, yes, it's dark right now, <laughs> but it can change. Look, even if you look out at the world and say, yeah, it seems so dark, or you look at your own life and say, it seems so dark. But you know what? There's always hope. Never lose hope. Remember what Paul says at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Faith, love, hope, all these things. This is what's most important. Of course, he ends on love is the best. But you've always got to hold on to hope. You've always got to recognize that there is beauty out there in the world. I know sometimes when you're depressed or when you, you're angry or maybe you've recently experienced divorce or a breakup or lost your job, you know, yeah, it's hard to see that there's beauty out there in the world. But God actually wants you to step out, to get outside of yourself, your own perception, your own thoughts about the world and see things from his perspective because that's where real life takes place. Allow yourself to believe that there is beauty out there, that God is out there, that he wants to actually bring you into this life. And I would say one of the greatest pieces of advice, if you're depressed, if you're struggling, if you're bitter, if you're angry right now, and you want to give yourself this wonderful Christmas present of peace and joy, 
follow the advice that Paul the Apostle gives in Romans chapter 5. Paul said, we continue to shout our praises, not when things are going great. We continue to shout our praises, not just when we're in church. We continue to shout our praises, Paul says, even when we're hemmed in with troubles. So even if you're struggling, even if you're depressed, even if you're angry, even if you're bitter, what do you think would happen to your psychological state? Set aside the spiritual state for just a moment. What would happen to your psychological state if rather than giving in to the bitterness or the anger and yelling and shouting, if you just said, praise God, literally, or you got down onto your knees and you just sang God's praises, you focused on all of the things for which you had to be grateful. How would your life change? You would let go of the bitterness. That's why I think it's counterintuitive, right? It's, it's easy. You're given that job raise, whatever it is. It's easy to go, oh, thank you, God. It's difficult to praise, to worship, to give thanks when you've just lost the job or you've lost the relationship. But that's exactly what God says, right? Paul, Romans chapter 5. I'm not making this up. If you have a problem with this, don't complain to me. Complain to God. And I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> you can if you want. That's, that's up to you. But Paul says is, you praise when you're struggling. He said, because remember, you're never left short change. Remember, if you're feeling despair right now, I, I want you to go, and I spoke about this. I put this on Twitter and other places today, a short little reflection, right? I offer short little reflections on Twitter if you'd like to see them or on Instagram, the Joe Sikora Show, at Joe Sikora Show. But I was speaking about this this morning on my Twitter thing that I put out, my Twitter thing. I'm really good at PR, right? Check out my Twitter things. Uh, but uh, Paul says in Romans chapter four, and if you're feeling despair and you're not moving, moving you don't know how to move forward, Here's the good news. You don't have to. You don't have to wait until you've got it all figured out. Paul speaks about this. And he talked about Abraham. Remember Father Abraham? Abraham, I will make you the father of many nations. Abraham was an old dude. I don't want to say this, but most people, when they're 100 and their wife is 90, they don't think, I think it's time to start a family. What do you think, honey? Huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's usually not when people start a family. But here's the deal, and this is what is applicable to your life. Abraham didn't look at his old 100 shriveled up body. I guess it was shriveled up. It was 100. He did live quite a few years later. But he didn't say, it's helpless. I can't do it. He didn't look at his old wife and say, it's helpless. She's 90. He plunged into the promise. He said, God, I can't do this. And you might look at your own life and with the bitterness that you feel, you might say to yourself rightly, I can't do this. I can't forgive. I can't let go. I can't let go of this resentment. I can't let go of all the bad that I'm feeling. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, fine, you can't. I accept that you, you can't do it if you say it. I believe you, but God can. And that's the difference. Remember, the God who raised the dead to life can raise you out of this darkness that you feel. It's not up to you. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say, I can't do this. Remember, and I want to leave with this thought, even though I have many thoughts I could continue to elaborate upon, but I don't want to bore you here. But I want to leave you with this thought. There are things in life that you cannot control. I don't want that to freak you out, right? For instance, it's going to rain here tomorrow in Southern California, a bitter, bitter winter. It's probably going to get down to the mid 60s. <laughs> I know those of you in Milwaukee, right? I know somebody's tuning in. It's like, huh? That's your winter? Yeah, it's going to rain and chilly. 65. You can't stop that. There are things in life that you can't control. But you can dress for it. You can put on the raincoat or the overcoat. You can change what you wear. 
you're always left with something to do. No matter where you are in your life, if you believe that life is so complete, what happened to the light? Just went off. I couldn't control it. I suppose I could reach down and plug it back in, but I'm not going to do it. We're just going to go with a slightly dimmer view of me. But if you believe that life is out of control and there's nothing you can do, again, there's a great book by Martin Seligman. I encourage you. I'll try to post this. It's called Learned Helplessness. And what it actually focuses on are people who, because of calamitous events or difficulties in life or trauma, they believe that that's it. It's over. When you have faith, when you have belief, it is never over. I'm going to leave you with a fishing example of what I'm talking about. And I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I like boating stories, right? I'm a boating guy. One day Jesus was preaching. It was a long sermon. It was a morning sermon. Sometimes like the masses I go to, and I enjoy. But it was a long sermon, and he was using Peter's boat as a pulpit. Now it was morning time, and Peter had been up all night fishing. He caught nothing. <laughs> and Jesus said, Peter, get back into the boat. Push out into the deep waters and cast the net. Peter looked at Jesus and said, I've been fishing all night. The luck ain't with me. I just got done cleaning the nets. <sighs> but if you say so, I'll do it. Peter pushed out into the deep water, cast the nets, and caught an abundance of fish. He couldn't even pull it in. He had to have his friends come over and help. Remember, some things you can control, some things you can't. But the God who is in control of the fish and the waters and the waves and the storms and the sun and the light and the moon, that God has control over you. And God has given you his spirit that lives and breathes and moves in you. You might have learned that you are helpless, but never forget that the God who lives in you is far from helpless. Believe, trust, give yourself the gift, let go of the bitterness, and live the life, the joy that God wants you to live this holy season, this holy life. I will meet you back on the road and remember, always forward.